Hello, everyone. Oh, sorry about that. Wasn't ready. Good morning or good afternoon. Welcome to Facebook Live. I'm Dr. Annette Mercatant, and we're here um, weekly except for next week. And uh, to answer your question, please enter your questions in, into the chat box or the uh, comment box here, um, or send them to COVID19 at stclaircounty.org. So the data today uh, continues to look uh, challenging. We have uh, continued to add new cases, uh, new hospitalizations, and new deaths. Those are our totals along the top, and changes in the last seven days are uh, 17 new COVID deaths, an average number of new cases per day, about 170, and we're up to close to a 26% uh, testing positivity. Um, I asked the question today whether this is looking uh, plateauish, and the answer is it's too soon to tell, I think. Um, so we still do not know whether this is going to continue to rise, whether we'll uh, stabilize off and come down, and if we do come down, whether it'll be a, a slow reduction or a rapid reduction. So a lot of uncertainty right now. Next slide. Our epi curve, which shows this kind of continuous elevation that we're seeing. Uh, as you can see, we're still not to the peak that we were in the spring, uh, but there are certainly days where it feels that way. And reporting remains of uh, cases still re remain somewhat sporadic. Next slide. Uh, we broke down some of the vaccination data so you can see uh, how we're doing. This is anyone who's had even at least one vaccine. You can see that we have um, our lowest age group vaccinated is our 5 to 11 year olds and um, our greatest uh, vaccinated group, our best vaccinated group, I should say, is our over 65. Um, if you look on the right hand side, the changes uh, from the end of November, not a lot of change with as far as um, extra, extra vaccines coming in. So we've kind of stalled um, at this kind of 50% mark. Next slide. And uh, this is how we're doing with vaccines. Uh, some increase in our first doses. I think that's the first doses, the orange bar. Yep, no, that's our second doses. First doses are the dark blue bar on the bottom. Second doses are the yeah, orange bars. And then the gray bar above is all the booster doses. So still uh, the primary uh, vaccines we're providing right now are booster doses, which I would say are very, very important. If you haven't received your booster dose, uh, please do so at your earliest convenience. Next slide. Uh, breakthrough and on uh, on and breakthrough cases. So we get a lot of questions about uh, the number of cases and vaccinated versus unvaccinated, and there still is a significant difference between cases in vaccinated versus cases in unvaccinated. Um, in fact, I believe we did some initial data, and the death rate for an unvaccinated person is six times the death rate of an unvaccinated individual. I'm looking to make sure I got that numbers right. But I mean, I think all the data that we're looking at nationally, statewide, and locally indicates a big difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals regarding the severity in particular of the infection. Next slide. And then these are our totals. Um, I believe today we're at 844 average cases per week per 100,000. This is above the state average. Uh, I just want to kind of going through that math in my head, wanted to remind people that for every case we know of, there's at least one or more likely two to three that we're not aware of. And if you do the math uh, of 800 plus some new cases per week that we're aware of, 1,300 to 1,600 perhaps cases per week. That's roughly 2% of our population at any given time that is currently infected with COVID. So uh, a great deal of risk out there. Um, it's likely that all of you will have exposures or infections um, over the coming months. And we just urge everyone to, to take the precautions they need to reduce that risk. Next slide, or, oh, I think those, that's all of our slides, right? Okay. So we'll get to our talking points. Um, 
I just kind of mentioned that, the, the fact that uh, with these high rates, your best bet is avoiding infection or delaying infection as long as you possibly can. And the best way of doing that, of course, number one is get vaccinated and particularly get fully vaccinated. And if you're six months beyond your vaccination, uh, do get your booster. Um, please wear a face mask uh, whenever you're indoors, particularly indoors around other people. Um, that is even if you're vaccinated, uh, just because when rates are this high, vaccinated people continue to get infected as well, albeit at a lower rate, um, the risk is still very real. Um, please continue to uh, practice physical distancing, good hygiene, hand hygiene, hand washing, avoiding touching your face, your nose, your eyes, and uh, regularly cleaning of high touch surfaces where the virus may persist. Now, this virus isn't particularly stable on inanimate objects, but it can certainly be in a little pu uh, pool of, of moisture uh, for several hours. So do, do make sure that you clean surfaces that might have been touched on a regular basis. Um, if you do become symptomatic, we urge you to get tested. It's impossible to tell the difference between other uh, respiratory illnesses caused by viruses and respiratory infections caused by COVID. You need that test to differentiate. Um, if you've been exposed, we encourage you to continue to avoid um, going out uh, without a mask. In fact, we want you to stay in for a minimum of seven days. Um, and if you can't do the full 10 days, we want you to get a test before you leave um, your um, quarantine situation. And we want you to continue to wear a mask um, all the time. Okay, um, did I miss anything? Oh, the monoclonals, yes, I missed monoclonals. So most important is that we do have um, a therapy that does reduce the risk of severe um, symptoms and the risk of hospitalizations and that is our monoclonal antibody therapy there's a variety of them available they all require a doctor's order uh, prescription to receive them and they need to be given uh, intravenously or um, in one situation they can be given in a shot form uh, but this isn't like a pill you can take go to your pharmacy and get a pill so if you have covid have that discussion with your health care provider if you don't have a health care provider, give us a call, 987-5300, and we'll talk to you about it. Uh, we have now um, a remarkable um, success, I believe, for our community. Um, all of our uh, health care provider agencies, our three hospitals and Tri-Hospital EMS, have banded together to provide support for an infusion clinic that we run a couple days a week to take uh, some of the burden off of our hospital systems, which also have monoclonal antibody um, available. And um, so, so we urge people to think about this. Monoclonals only work if they're given in the first uh, week or so of infection. I believe uh, the uh, limit is 10 days, but the sooner you get it, um, the more effective it is. So we want people to think about this early on. Now, there are eligibility requirements. It's not just for everybody, uh, but we'll walk you through that. Your doctor knows what those are and um, will determine um, best if you would benefit from the monoclonals. It's worth asking about. And just one thing to add too, Doc, <clears throat> is that we're looking for um, medical volunteers so people can register right. as a volunteer on myvolunteerregistry.org, or they can call the health department, they can call the COVID line, or send us an email and it'll get to the right staff person here. Who's yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot that. to make that plea, and, and that is an urgent plea, because um, through all of our systems, it is the staff resource that is most limiting right now. Um, with uh, the full burden of inpatient census, um, Staffing has been an issue for a while. It's just been more critical now. And we do um, need um, those retired nurses out there who want to give back a little bit to your community. Anybody who still um, remembers how to do um, IVs, um, we do need to vet you. You need to be fully vaccinated. We don't want you in a clinic where um, it's filled with COVID positive people without that support, but we are looking for support for these clinics. So um, that's my volunteer, mi volunteer.org to sign up, um, or you can give, uh, send us your name through the COVID 19 
email and we'll direct you to the right resources, the right person to, to do that screening. Okay. The other thing I just want to reiterate to, for those who are watching or we'll, who will rewatch re the show is we will not have a show next week. However, the weeks of Christmas and New Year's, we are going to switch our days. So on the week of Christmas, our show is uh, Wednesday, December 22nd at 3.30. And the week of New Year's, it is Tuesday, December 28th at 3.30. Okay. We'll see if there's any questions on the live feed. Uh, this is from Heidi. She said, hello, Dr. Annette. How many have COVID as of right now in St. Clair County? Do you know of any that got the booster shot? Did anyone come down with COVID or are you seeing that the booster is working? Well, the booster is working. We're pretty confident of that. I don't, do we have any case? I think we do 17 cases where a person has had more than their primary series and have had a confirmed case, right, of, of COVID. So a few, yeah. I mean, these these nothing's perfect, so we want people to recognize that. But um, there's no question. Um, the literature is very solid. Um, the the, the um, observational information is very solid that uh, the vaccine, in particular the booster, is absolutely um, boosting that immunity. Um, and so the other part of that question, guys went away. Um, how many COVID as of right now in St. Clair County? I mentioned it was 844 new cases per week per 100,000. And we have a population of roughly 160,000. I think I did that math. It was about 1,300 cases. Is that about right? Does that sound about right? Probably about 1,300, over 1,000 per week um, that we know of. Okay, so again, I'll just reiterate that the cases we know about are certainly not the full case load, and we're going to uh, estimate that we probably have double that that burden right now. Okay, um, Heidi also said thank you for keeping us updated all the time too. Uh, the next question is from Penny: If a person has had their two Moderna vaccines, why was only one third the amount given for the booster? If you get Pfizer for that, also a no, person. No. Go ahead. We'll start there. Okay, so so <laughs> the boosters were all studied as far as um, when you give it to an individual who's had a full primary series, how their um, antibodies, um, their neutralizing antibodies respond. Um, in case of Moderna, they found that a half dose of Moderna gives the same full booster effect as. Um, the the full dose that's used in the primary series so that's just what the 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 um studies are shown in the case of pfizer they still use the full dose of pfizer for that booster effect um and it's just the clinical studies that are done johnson and johnson they use the full dose of johnson and johnson so um it's just the way things go. Um, medicine is is a complex science, and you do the you do the studies, and you look at the results, and you do the analysis, and you say this is what works. So, that's what works. Her other part of her question was also a person on Humira for Crohn's had their two Moderna, vac Moderna vaccines, but then why were they given only half the amount of Moderna for their booster? This was right. not in our county. As I just said, the, the, the booster dose for Moderna is a half dose of Moderna for everyone. That's okay. what they should be receiving. No matter what. Okay. All right. That, um, but not for the third dose, by the way. Okay. Oh. Remember that immunocompromised people, thank you for reminding me of that, immunocompromised people who have severe immunocompromise are recommended to get three doses of an mRNA vaccine, both Pfizer and Moderna, as their primary series. And those three doses are full doses of the same. It's only that booster dose of Moderna that's recommended to be given at a half, half a dose. All right. And that's um, for everyone. The next question, is, well, Penny said, thank you for all your helpful info. Uh, Judy said, can you please repeat the days for this update during the next few weeks? Yeah, so, I know. It's a little confusing. Yeah. So next, 
next week we won't have a show and we will make sure on our social media feed normally we post a reminder the day before that will remind everybody through social media and then the week of christmas it is um, wednesday december 22nd at 3 30 and then the week of new year's it's tuesday december 28th at 3 30 and each week we'll also have it on social media as well yeah and that's primarily because thursday is a holiday for the county and I think we had to do a Wednesday and a Tuesday because of availability of staff. Now, I will yes. say in January, after the New Year's, we'll be back to our Thursday, correct, Jen? At yep. the normally scheduled time. So yes. we'll, in January, we'll be back to Thursday. Uh, Amanda said, thank you, Doctor and MDHHS, for the updates and trying to keep us all safe and informed. And Elise, I'm just going to chime in for a second. Um, I don't see any other questions. Do you see the something I'm not seeing? Because if my phone's acting up. Okay. Nicole asks, what is the time frame if any of you should wait for the booster after being vaccinated? So it, you want to uh, wait six months for your MR, if your primary series was an mRNA vaccine. And if your primary series was the J&J, &J, which is a single dose, if you remember, J&J &J is a single dose, um, you would only need to wait two months uh, for your booster after that. Okay. The next question comes from Shay. I was sharing weekly information from you, St. Clair County, in a neighborhood group that I was in where I live in Riley. So because of that, they have removed and blocked me from the group. How are we to cope with being surrounded by hate and deniers? What is the next plan of action when folks still deny what needs to be done? This is not living. Yeah, that's a great question, Shay, and I, I, I wish I knew the answer to that. You know, ultimately, we all have to live our truths. We have to do the best we can. Um, this virus, um, as we all know, is, is real, and if you don't believe it's real, it doesn't matter. The virus is real, <laughs> so it'll still make the impact it's going to make, and we'll respond. You know, I try and tell my staff every day that... Um, in medicine, when we take care of people who are sick, uh, we give them the best advice we can, the most updated information, and we try and move them towards a place of healing where they'll feel better. They may or may not choose to accept our prescriptions, our, our advice. And in that case, as, as physicians, we generally don't refuse to take care of them. We just kind of wait for what happens next. And pick up the pieces and keep going. And I kind of think of our community and I absolutely think of our community in the same way. Um, in public health, the patient is, is the community itself. And despite the fact that some are not paying attention or downright uh, refusing to believe, it doesn't change the fact that we're still trying uh, to provide help and support. Um, when and if uh, they get sick, we'll still be here to provide that information and that guidance. And we'll continue to find the gaps in our in our healthcare services to try and make sure everyone has access to what they need if they get sick. Um, and the rest, um, the rest is up to all you. Um, you know, I, I it's not about fighting. It's it's just about being able to continue to serve the best way we can. Uh, she Jen, also do you have any comments. Do you have anything to yeah. add? About <laughs> I, I agree. I she's, agree the front end, she's the front end of the comments. So it's easy for me to say, oh, we'll just keep trying to help, right? But we yeah. don't have to listen to the rhetoric. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I would say if it's too much, um, and it does get too much, even for us, sometimes you just have to turn it off. Um, take that break. Um, you know, close your eyes. Think of something good. Listen to what, whatever makes you feel better. Um, that's healthy for you. Um, try it and just kind of regroup. Um, because there's always going to be the haters and the naysayers um, out there. And, you know, you just have to live your truth and, and, and do what you know is right. Shay also continued on and she said, I'm so grateful for all the info you provide. Too bad I can't share it with my community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Shay. Mm -hmm. uh, Ke Kelly asks, if someone receives monoclonal antibody, how long do you need to wait to get vaccinated? Right. We want you to wait 90 days. Okay, and that's kind of an arbitrary choice, but that's the one that's been passed along. Um, so um, 
there's a little caveat to that, but in general, we want 90 days before you can get vaccinated. And if you're getting monoclonal because you have COVID, that's not a terrible thing because remember your, your natural infection with COVID is also going to boost your immunity. The monoclonal antibodies are not going to suppress that immune response. So we are also saying that after an, a natural, a, a, a wild acute infection, right, that you um, don't have, you have that same status of a fully vaccinated person for about 90 90 days, um, only because that's as far as our, our literature and our studies have gone. It may be a little longer for some people, but for some people, as soon as that 90 days is up, um, the immunity does start to wane and taper off. So um, if, if you've got monoclonal and you know that you're due for a booster and you feel like, oh my gosh, now I got to wait, don't be, don't be distressed because of the unfortunate infection that you got. And the, you know, the reason why you got your monoclonal is in fact providing you some extra immunity um, that should cover you for those 90 days until you can get your booster. And Kelly said, thank you so much for that information. Mm -hmm. And that's all the questions I see, unless Elise, if there's anything I missed, um, because my phone had acted up last week, but so far I don't see anything else. So it's 3.50, Doc. Um, I don't know if you want to end Love the show it. a few minutes early, but... early. Yeah, no, I just want to thank everyone. Hang in there. Um, the next couple of weeks are going to be very compelling. Um, and as an addition to the fact that it's before the holidays, right? So it just makes everything kind of challenging. Um, so take your time. Go slow. Think it through. Please Doc, wear your masks. We did have one question pop up as soon oh, as we said okay. that. And this right. is from, um, our, I think it's called, oh, she has two questions. She said, hold on. Okay, Areen, I think her name is, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but Areen, if a vaccinated parent tests positive for COVID, how long should a child who can't be away from the parent quarantine? Yeah, so regardless of your vaccination status, if you get COVID, you get COVID. And your ability to infect other people is is there, right? There's all kinds of discussion of whether a vaccinated person will get the same severity, the same viral load. All of that is still kind of not fully answered. So you get COVID, regardless of your vaccination status, you need to isolate for 10 days. And for those people who can't avoid you, uh, they need to quarantine for officially, you know, it's still 14 days quarantine, uh, 10 days quarantine, uh, or seven days quarantine with a test out option. All those things are available depending on what your personal circumstances are, but their quarantine date starts from the last day of your infectious period. So your son or daughter or your children who live with you, their quarantine process would start on the last day of your isolation, which really extends things quite a bit. So in those situations, if there's school issues or whatever, you might want to go for the shorter quarantine with those, in, with those kids and do that test out option after day five to get them back into their um, routine a little quicker, assuming they don't get sick. I was wondering too if she meant um, what if it's a young child who can't be away from the sick parent? Well, then you just um, you do your best, right? You try and you know, you try and cover you stay masked, you wash your hands, you do your best not to share your respiratory secretions with them. And that child needs to begin their quarantine on the last day of mom's potentially infectious uh, date, which was would be day 10 after the onset of her symptoms, right? Or day 10, if she's asymptomatic, day 10 after her positive test. That's the last day she could potentially be infectious the vast majority of times. So um, the child then would need to, you'd have to monitor the child from, not just from the time that they've been with you all along, but for uh, the remainder of the quarantine period after that last infectious day. I don't know if I'm making sense with that. Is that clear, Jen? Does that make sense to you? It does. Um, All right, let's let's look said, at. So, okay, she, say, she said, "Thank you." Not really begin, but continue, right? That yeah. Was, so that's that's probably a better way to say you would con you would extend their quarantine. So you would want to start monitoring your child, obviously, from the minute you knew you had COVID, right? You're going to monitor them. Uh, but you're still infectious during that time. So they would need to be monitored beyond your isolation date for a minimum of seven days with a test or 10 days, ideally, 
uh, for that period beyond an extended period of what you'd be watching for. And she commented back, yes, ma'am, thank you. Okay, so good. She got it. Um, we did have two more questions. This is from Lisa. A friend took two rapid tests, same day was positive for COVID. Work made him go to MedExpress three days later to confirm it was negative, question mark? Yeah, no, you don't need um, a test out. If you're positive, you're positive. Um, and we actually don't recommend um, subsequent testing unless you're not sure if the positive was um and if you're positive antigen test needs a confirmed test it should be done within 24 hours within 24 hours because remember there are two different tests and a pcr test the the molecular test is actually identifying the viral uh, Ge genomic sequence um, that could be in your nose. And after three days, it might not be there anymore. It doesn't mean you weren't positive. It doesn't mean you're not still infectious. It just means that it's not in your nose anymore. Okay. So, um, and you don't want to use that negative test three days later to say that you weren't positive to begin with. The person who was positive three days before needs to isolate for the full 10 days and getting a negative test three days later doesn't get them off the hook of that. Um, so we want people to still isolate for the full 10 days. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of confusion. There's, there's a lot where we've just revised um, our flow sheets and our explanations. Is that up on our website yet? Not Jen? yet. We were waiting for final look at final approval Soon. so we're all we're all kind of trying to revise a little bit so we align we're trying we're going to try and align what we're telling schools with we're telling everybody else right so that there aren't two sets of criteria for everything everybody's going to follow the same guidance and um hopefully that'll make it a little less uh, complicated but just remember if you're sick regardless of your vaccination status uh, we want you to isolate yourself for 10 days so you don't spread that virus around. Um, if you're just an exposure, just an exposure, if you're an exposure, there's a lot of variabilities to consider. Were you, were you, are you vaccinated? Um, were you fully masked? Um, are you in a situation where you're exposing yourself to other high-risk people? So those are the things uh, we'll have a separate, so we'll have one guidance for um, be having COVID, being COVID positive or being sick with COVID, and then a other uh, a second um, guidance for just being exposed to somebody with COVID and what are the difference. But remember that the confusing part is is the exposure part. Like, what do you do if I'm exposed and I'm not sick yet? Right, that issue. Whereas if you're sick with COVID or been tested with COVID, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, everybody ten days and you don't test out of an isolation. Because you, you, once you're positive, we assume that you have viral shedding for 10 days. And we don't have any way of proving that otherwise. You can't go in and get a test and say, see, I'm not shedding virus anymore because we just don't have that reliability yet. So um, keep that in mind. All right. And then Heidi asks, if a fully vaccinated person does catch COVID, will they be able to do the monoclonal antibody? I was just wondering. Yes. Yeah. Your vaccination status does not change the therapeutics at all of what kind of treatment you might receive. So yeah, if you get it and you, if you have COVID, even if you're fully vaccinated, particularly if you're a high risk person, remember monoclonal is not for everyone, but certainly for the people that would at, be at highest risk. Remember, um, fully vaccinated people are still dying. <laughs> um, they're still ending up in the hospital just at less numbers than, than the unvaccinated. So uh, don't take any chances. If you're high risk, even though you're fully vaccinated, do seek out care. Um, Al Alyssa, or Alicia, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, she asked, how long after testing positive can you be vaccinated? We want to make sure that you're no longer contagious so that you may you don't give your vaccinator COVID. That means you should be at least out of your isolation period. That was 10 days. And we want you to be feeling better because we all know that this vaccine can make you feel kind of achy for a couple of days. So we want you to feel better. Um, you know, coughs can linger a long time. As long as you're up and about and you're feeling back um, pretty good and you're past that 10 days, you can get um, a vaccine. You do not need to wait after an illness. You do not need to wait 90 days. You only need to wait 90 days after monoclonal treatment. 
I think sometimes people get confused on those two points. So thanks for well, clarifying but, those. Yeah, because we also say, look, if you've if you've been sick, you have, you know, we're going to treat you like a vaccinated person for 90 days. So there is a little bit of overlap there that makes it confusing. But as far mm -hmm. as seeking vaccine, you can seek vaccine immediately after your isolation period if you're feeling better. But okay. you do have, okay, but you do have that 90 day window where we assume your immune system has been boosted. Okay, so um, I know after I got COVID, um, I had either not been fully vaccinated, I can't even remember anymore. No, I hadn't been vaccinated yet. And I kind of delayed my vaccine because I knew I had that 90. I don't, don't think I waited a whole 90 days, but there was, if you remember back then, there was all kinds of giant, everybody wanted the shot at the same time. And I didn't mm -hmm. want to take a spot from somebody else who needed it more right. than me. So that's why I waited because there is a, an assumption that after you've been infected, that you get a little boost of your immunity for um, a couple months, 90 days. Okay. And Wendy um, came in and she said, so many not masking in public, discouraging. Put yeah. yours on. You know, even even though um, it would be better if everyone's masked, you masking, not only is it source control protecting other people, but there is more and more evidence to suggest that it does protect the wearer to some degree. And I've mentioned before about this issue of viral load. Um, it may make a difference whether you have a million variants land on your nose or a half dozen. It could make a difference between how sick you are. So a mask can obviously help with that. It's not going to stop everything because the air is still coming in, but it may definitely help uh, with um, the probability of you getting sick or the severity of you getting sick. And speaking of masks, Stacy asked, why is masking not required in the school, all schools right now with such high numbers? It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Because it's become a political issue. And I believe masks should be worn in the schools by everyone because we have a lot of data that supports the fact that there's less cases in the school as a result. And less cases means less illness, which means less hospitalizations and less deaths. Okay, that's it for the questions that I see. So we won't see you again till Wednesday, December 22nd. Any closing Good. remarks, Doc? Anything I already did else? that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. See Everyone. you in a couple of weeks.